a survey. I think that's still happening through Cal EPA, isn't it? Yes, it is. And there's a link on our website to the survey form. I just want to point out briefly, I promised several of the regions I would do so, mm. um, that when you go to the target sheets, that a number of the regions um, may feel that they have accomplished more than is reflected. Right. Eric pointed out several of the reasons why. But a number of the regions, and I want to point to Region 6 in particular, has made a very concerted effort to reach out to us and to um, indicate that they want to work closely on track tracking their targets into next year um, because they believe that their work perform demonstrates performance more so than the cards do and that's a function of um, data entry, um, the way we look at things and they will work to resolve those issues with us. I, I, I wanted to make sure we acknowledge that uh, there is this audit, that, you know, we're doing some systematic audits right. of our programs and I think that's a good way of getting at your third party e evaluation of, of uh, customer service and other things uh, as well as the targets. Yeah, we're doing the um, program review of the NPDES program and in fact the uh, the consultants working on that are reaching out to stakeholders and get, trying to get an external uh, opinion as to where, we, where we're doing well and where we could improve. Great. Thank you. It, it looks great. And if we didn't have such a packed agenda, I would suggest we spend even more time going through the document. But that was uh, terrific. So thank you very much for that work. Yeah, I think Rafa needs some kind of nickname, you know, master of the of the mouse or I I'll work on it. <laughs> well, we're the navigator. Something else. <laughs> navigator. The navigator. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, we have a, a one speaker card on this item. Uh Michael Garabedian, Mr. Garabedian. Hello. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm Michael Garabedian with Friends of the North Fork, North Fork American River Group. I have uh, a question. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question has to do with to what extent uh, public input is part of the, uh, the analysis and um, of the performance. Uh, and I, I can think of several examples. Uh, outreach to the public in terms of training or public meetings on issues before the regional and state boards, which could simply be counted. Um, and then uh, in terms of the public, environmental groups, dischargers, uh, whoever, um, the question would be, the issue would be, the evaluation would be uh, the number of public members and stakeholder groups, public members, environmental groups, and so forth, uh, the numbers participating in as parties in NPDES permits or asking for hearings and having party status, um, the number of t uh, times meeting with staff, the number of different public members individually or groups or dischargers meeting with staffs or perhaps at this very mic, um, certainly at this very mic. Uh, so, and part of the question is, uh, does the board have goals and protocols for public involvement. And finally, um, I'm glad to learn about the NPDES program review. I certainly hope we'd be contacted. Thank you. Any, I don't know if we can answer all of those, but can someone answer some of those? Well, actually, I have a question for the speaker. Um, I appreciate the suggestion, and I think it might be a good idea to discuss with Gita Kapahi, our chief of public participation, some way to capture her work and the, the public um, involvement effort on our performance report. But I have a question for you. Um, all of the issues you identified are, again, more of the number, and I am a numbers person, I love it, and, and more of the, the output counting. If I were to ask you to give me some outcome metrics for what you're trying to capture, how would you, I mean, what would you say? I mean, capturing the number of people who come up to speak is one thing, and number of people who attend a workshop is one thing, but ultimately, what is the outcome that we're trying to measure through our public participation effort? 
Uh, I, I think the and if it's, it's and you, we know that we cannot make everyone happy. That's never a goal. Well, so I, I don't know that the outcome is happiness or unhappiness. Hopefully, the outcome is uh, effective involvement by different parties, whether it's dischargers or and how do you measure effective members of the public? Well, first of all, and I think this is where the numbers would come in if they are there. To what extent they are there? and to what extent the public is seated on uh, round tables or stakeholder groups and, and that kind of thing. Okay. But, but it really starts, for instance, on NPDES. Our group has worked on been getting involved to a certain extent on, with one municipality in our watershed. And um, uh, the kind of training, the kind of things we would like to see go on and have requested, for instance, on uh, discharge of uh, municipality uh, re permit renewal was a public meeting denied. Um, um, major, a major issue in the community uh, uh, to us. So if, if, if a problem for us is if these things aren't done by the board, we have to think about doing them ourselves. We feel, okay, maybe we're the ones that should put on a public meeting and just inform the public about what's going on so they know. But th then they need the tools to understand the 200-page the format for NPDES permits that are apparently directed by this board. People you know, need to understand how to read that and how to deal with that. I think that should be a goal. But I think, I think in some, I, I would look to the, the fact that NPDE, public involvement in NPDES is mandatory and required. And uh, if there aren't, if the answer to my question is there aren't goals and protocols for it, we'd be happy to be glad to help suggest what they should be. Thank you. Thank you. That, Thank that's you. a conversation to have. I know we have Thank objectives you. on that, but we should just talk to Gita about what would be useful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. I All right. Now I will. Um, watching the blood sugar and caffeine levels in the audience and knowing we still have a lot to do, we will take a short break and come back at 10 after 11.
except that we got a tip. We might have to go straight by. And is it in the second row? <laughs> That's right. Oh, I didn't think about that. Good point. You just skip over the state board. So when she's not in here, you can hear her. It's all on us now. I think it's left to do ourselves. So we spent all day doing speaker wires all over the place and cat five cables. And now it's the time to do it before we have to seal up the walls and the basement. Well, we had a number of things already run, and our contractors, oh, this is in the way 
Expensive monster cable, like that wide. Snip, snip. <laughs> so, it's inexcusable. It, yeah. Um, our foundation guy is um, is an absolute genius. He does things in his way. You don't have to get into that. We'll find somebody else. <laughs> we don't want to mess up on foundation. Oh, so. gosh, you don't. Particularly, yeah, when you're digging down eight feet, the can't water around. Water gives you where you are. We don't, we don't. Fortunately, our soil is uh, extremely well draining, sandy loam for miles. I leave a hose running overnight, and there is no pond in water. Uh, and in winter, the water table is But not intersecting. Even so, we have uh, all the walls have a, like a wall of torches filter thing that creates a high volume barrier. Toe drains bottom of the pond. And then there's drains in the gravels going down into the sun and the pond in the back. We install LID, and all of, our, all of our drains no longer go into the sewer system, they go into the dry well. And time we finally got all the roofs and all of them done. Start again. It's a priority thing.
uh, will reconvene. Oops. Hi. Can we turn on the... Thanks. Uh, moving along on our hefty agenda today, um, I, just for the information of the folks who were on item 11, um, obviously we were right that it wouldn't start before 1030. Maybe a little, a oh, maybe a little optimistic. So I'm just looking at the, I, I, it's hard to judge. We have speaker cards on the next two items, um, which will undoubtedly take us till past 12. And so I think I'd love to start as early as we can, but I do think it's safe to say that um, we're unlikely to start before one if we take any kind of a lunch break, and I think we should. Um, so we'll check in again a little later in the agenda, but if uh, folks have things they need to do outside, I think it's probably safe to say we won't start item 11 until one o'clock. All right. Item number seven. Who's introducing this? You. Hello, Eric. Here Hello. you are again. I'm back for item seven. Is, is, is this your new favorite template, or have I just missed uh, this one before? It, it I noticed it going through it. It is new. It, it, is it doesn't have any waves on it. There's something water on it, but it's lovely. <laughs> Thank you. It's kind of corporate, yeah. Um, this is item seven, consideration of a proposed resolution directing actions to reduce cost of compliance. I've got a couple options for you given the time uh, and your very full agenda. Uh, there's, a, there's a slide that goes over uh, the background information here, but given that you've had a couple of uh, updates, I don't think that's necessary. There's a couple slides that uh, summarize the proposed actions in the resolution, but uh, you know, the other option is really just to skip to the comments and uh, proposed changes in the interest of time, if you're agreeable to that, okay. You, you might want to quickly just go through the slides, just for anybody who's watching on the webcast. We don't have to go back to basics, but I would just okay. click, I will. click through them and with a couple lines about what it's about, so. Sure. So just in terms of background, this uh, project all started in 2011. Uh, board directed us to, or the Office of Research Planning and Performance to develop a resource alignment report. We completed that report uh, and at the completion of it, uh, we were uh, then directed to focus on cost of compliance and work with stakeholders to evaluate opportunities to reduce cost of compliance. At that point, four stakeholder groups were formed. They're listed there uh, and um, to date, we've, got, uh, we've done a number of progress updates, in informational items from the board, and now today we're considering a uh, proposed resolution uh, that basically gives direction on uh, next steps, mainly in response to recommendations that were developed by the NPDS POTW stakeholder group. In terms of next steps, uh, the first one is actually one that is uh, directed toward the other stakeholder groups, those being stormwater irrigated lands and uh, WDR stakeholders. And the proposed resolution essentially uh, directs staff to continue to work with these groups uh, to further develop uh, their uh, recommendations, and specifically the WDR stake stakeholder groups have developed a set of recommendations, and we will will be working with them. We've pulled together a staff work group to review those recommendations, and we'll be working with them to get back to them with questions and ideas uh, so that we can uh, further refine that. Uh, the second uh, directive, as I'll call it, is to evaluate uh, the sanitary uh, sewer system requirements that are established by regional boards. Uh, these are the ones uh, that uh, potentially overlap with the requirements uh, established through a statewide general order and to make uh, recommendations as to whether those requirements uh, are appropriate uh, to maintain. Uh, third uh, bullet is just to uh, 
continue to document, report on additional steps and current practices uh, to ensure that our process uh, for issuing individual in NPDES permits is transparent and consistent with a focus on identifying duplic duplicative or unnecessary monitoring requirements, uh, encouraging the use of surrogate or representative sampling when that can uh, save costs without impacting the ability to regulate, and also uh, ensuring that we are documenting the need for special studies and not requiring studies that do not provide value. Uh, next, uh, continuing uh, with the... Uh, just one quick second. On that last point, is the, uh, I'm calling it an audit, but is that is the look into the NPDES program uh, addressing some of those specific issues? The NPDES program evaluation, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not really an audit, um, is mainly focused on the efficiency of the of the program and how how we issue uh, permits, how we conduct inspections, and looking at it's similar in that it's going to be looking at how all the different regional boards conduct those different activities and trying to identify best practices and make recommendations for mainly process improvements. They won't be looking so much at the content of permits. Oops, skipped ahead there. Uh, next uh, directive in the uh, resolution is to convene uh, workshops and training with U US EPA to develop a common and better understanding on the use of our existing regulatory tools, and these include water effects ratios and uh, mixing zone and dilution credit studies, use attainability analysis, and site-specific objectives in effluent uh, limit development. Next, uh, pilot uh, the evaluation of cost consideration in the development of the biological objectives policy. So one of the recommendations that the NPDES stakeholders made was uh, uh, they actually developed a checklist of cost considerations that they think should be uh, part of the uh, permit development or policy development process. And uh, as a pilot to see if that's a useful exercise uh, we're proposing doing that as part of uh, development of the biological objectives policy. Uh, next, evaluate and identify best practices uh, for incorporating provisions in TMDLs that uh, better provide for phased implementation and uh, periodic review. So that will involve uh, working with the TMDL roundtable to looking at what we're currently doing and trying to identify are there more opportunities to phase TMDLs such that we're focused on the, uh, you know, what's going to provide the most water quality benefit first. And then lastly, just uh, report progress on these efforts every six months to the board. So with that, um, we received one comment letter from the NPDES POTW stakeholders, actually from uh, California Association of Sanitation Agencies, Adam Link, staff there on behalf of the POTW stakeholders. Generally, their comments were supportive of the resolution, appreciative of the work on this, both from the board and from staff, uh, expressing their dedication and the work that they've already put into this and uh, that you know, some of the action that we've already taken has saved, um, already saved the POTW stakeholders statewide uh, money, and they're looking forward to working with us. They did request one uh, modification to resolve number three. Uh, that's the one dealing with the SSO requirements, and they requested that we clarify the requirement to reduce no spill reporting uh, when it's determined that a regional board SSO order is in place and should remain in place. So there were two parts to that. One was evaluate, is it appropriate to have two orders in place that cover the, the same or similar activity? And then the other part was, uh, was when it's determined that yes, in fact, it is appropriate that a similar reduction in monitoring frequently, uh, no spill reporting frequency be implemented, similar to the recent changes that were made uh, to the statewide order. You mean if, if it is? If, if it's if it's if it is determined, not if it when. is if it is determined, right? right. If yeah. Um, so with with that change, actually, what we ended up doing was leaving the first part of the directive that basically focuses on evaluating if it is appropriate to have mm -hmm. the the two orders in place, uh, and we struck out the part about. Um, 
about uh, implementing the uh, no spill re reporting requirement. We just felt for, for simplicity and clarification, it was best to focus on the evaluation first and uh, not try to prescribe an action at this, at this stage. Uh, other late revisions were fairly straightforward. Uh, there's a, a late revision uh, chain sheet at the back of the room, and I have extra copies if you, you don't have copies. But basically, we um, added a little bit of specificity to whereas 12C, just background information um, on the cost savings and uh, the cost of monitoring and the potential savings that uh, the PODWs believe could be realized by improving monitoring efficiency and reporting efficiency. And then we extended compliance dates uh, for resolve three and four to provide what the staff believed was sufficient time uh, to, to get that work accomplished. And then lastly, we added a completion date to resolve seven. Uh, that's the, that's the, the TMDL uh, action and there was no completion date prior to this. So that's a summary of you know what the resolution says and the changes to date. Great, thank you, Eric. That was helpful. Um, anybody want to say anything before we turn to speaker cards? We have a number of them. Okay, we'll move to the speaker cards. First, we have Adam Link from Casa. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and Board Members. Adam Link with the California Association of Sanitation Agencies. Thank you, Eric. Did a great job describing our comment letter and, and our comments on this issue. And on behalf of the NPDES wastewater stakeholders, we appreciate the opportunity to comment on the cost of compliance resolution that is before you today. Uh, first, we'd like to recognize the ongoing commitment and engagement of the board, and in particular, Board Member Dodak, in um, pushing this through and to being a key proponent of the initiative and working with staff, stakeholders to address concerns and to get this resolution uh, before you today. As you may know, CASA has, uh, on behalf of the wastewater stakeholders, played an active role in this resource alignment process. And uh, over the last year, we've submitted various draft proposals, attended stakeholder meetings, and appeared before the board on several occasions to discuss our progress on these issues. Uh, we believe this resolution and the initiative generally is very timely in light of the fee increases that are also proposed for today's meeting. Uh, our agencies face significant fiscal challenges and ratepayer concerns, and finding ways to offset some portion of increased fees with these types of cost of compliance reduction proposals, none of which have impacts to water quality, uh, is a great help to our member local wastewater agencies. Um, in terms of the specifics of the resolution itself, we appreciate that one of the NPDS uh, stakeholder proposals has already been implemented, and I'm referring to the changes in the recent SSS WDR uh, monitoring and reporting program, and specifically the changes to the no spill reporting requirement going from monthly to quarterly. Um, this is a very simple change, a prime example of one of the things that we were talking about. No water quality impacts, and it's estimated to save our agencies approximately $100,000 annually going forward. So we just thought it was a great example of something that's already been done that we proposed and um, has actually already been implemented. So we very much appreciate that. Also, we appreciate the resolution's uh, acknowledgement that several changes proposed by wastewater stakeholders, uh, including some of the ones that Eric mentioned, eliminating overlapping monitoring requirements, reducing monitoring frequencies for parameters that are consistently in compliance, and eliminating unnecessary, uh, potentially unnecessary reporting um, could save individual agencies hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially and then in the aggregate across the state tens of millions of dollars um, across the life of programs. So we appreciate the acknowledgement in the resolution and uh, that was one of the issues that we had focused on in our proposals. Finally, we appreciate that uh, finding ways to reduce the cost of compliance will not simply end here with this resolution but also will result in an ongoing process where the state and regional board staff as well as stakeholders can come together and identify inefficiencies and build on success stories uh, from each of the regions to create a better statewide system. That was one of the things that uh, I found uh, pretty interesting throughout this process was that there are a lot of success stories from individual regions and a lot of things that we can take away and if we can just use those on a statewide basis, uh, there's a lot of opportunities there. And we also appreciate that the inclusion of specific dates for completion in each of the task items in the resolution uh, will help facilitate progress and keep everyone uh, on track towards meeting the goals that we've set so far. Uh, as a final note, in our comment letter, 
we did ask for changes to resolve number three uh, related to the SSS um, general order. We are totally acceptable with the changes that have been made in the recent change sheet and uh, we appreciate that those changes kind of clarified the issue that we were looking for. Uh, we'd only ask uh, that if the regional boards are to continue to regulate the SSS outside of or in addition to the general order uh, that they would clarify that the separate orders are to include the nose pill certification as we had described um, that's in you know, now in the general order. So uh, in, in summation, uh, we support the adoption of the resolution as modified by the change sheet today and uh, we look forward to working with uh, water board members and staff during the implementation phase of this resolution and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Link. You. And Jeanette, you, I think you set that for five minutes. Can we make these three minutes? I mean, just we've talked about this an awful lot, so people should be able to give us high points or concerns within three minutes, since we've had a lot of, we've had a lot of discussion of this, and we didn't get many written comments. So I just assume we move it along and understand. We'll still listen. You can make whatever points you need to make in three minutes, but um, I want to be able to keep the pace up. I can't because I'm not following directions. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to drink more of this coffee and then I promise to be better. Kay. Next we have Bob Gore. On behalf of the WDR group. Uh, Chair Marcus, board members and staff, good morning. Um, on behalf of the WDR stakeholder group and our co-chair Emily Rooney, we'd like to express our strong support uh, for this resolution and also congratulate uh, especially board member Dodok and um, staff Tom and uh, John and Karen and, and Eric for their leadership in this, this watershed endeavor. Uh, briefly, and uh, I can't promise um, coherence, I've been up since 4 o'clock. Our fourth grandchild was born this morning. Oh, oh, so, congratulations, um, that's great. I'll do the best I can with the consciousness I've got left. Um, <laughs> Compliance through flexibility is, is one thing we, strong, we strongly support uh, in, in achieving uh, environmental protection through outcomes as opposed to um, firm regulation. Um, eliminate and reducing reports and testing. This provides more resources for envi environmental protection. Um, consistent guidelines. Uh, facilitating interagency, you know, beyond collaboration, but facilitating interagency understanding and relationships is called out and th that's a good thing. Um, encouraging innovation with incentives uh, rather than punishment. And then beyond the resolution, uh, working with the Department of Finance, um, they're doing something called SB 617 um, from 2012. It's the State Regulatory Impact Assessment. Uh, uh, this is an undertaking that applies directly to what the resolution is, is doing. Also, uh, working with SEEB, the California Council on Economic and Environmental Balance, on their long-term um, uh, reform plans, which plug directly into the resolution. Um, we'll stay involved. We look forward to the, uh, the, the six-month uh, uh, report and, and commenting on that and, and, and participating. Also, in, in closure, <coughs> excuse me, there are two uh, uh, resolutions on the agenda today, an ironic juxtaposition. Uh, the one following um, directly inputs into the cost of compliance, and we'd urge, as you always do, your careful consideration of that one. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Ken Landau, Region 5. Thank you for all your hard work on this. It was yeah. invaluable. Ken Landau, Assistant Executive Officer, Region 5. Actually, I'd marked, if, if needed, uh, Tom oh, Mumley is just an executive officer from Region 2, and I have been working on this. And we are here to answer questions if you have any. Great. So. And if I can just take a moment and truly thank uh, both Ken and Tom, and also not in the audience, but Dave Smith with US EPA Region 9. The three of you have been extremely helpful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I didn't mean to exclude you, Tom. You're an extremely helpful person. <laughs> You're an extremely useful engine, as my grandson would say. Um, next, we have Sharon Green, Sanitation Districts, L.A. County. Hi. That's sort of daunting. Um, good morning, uh, Chairwoman Marcus and members of the board. I'm Sharon Green with L.A. County Sanitation Districts. Um, I will be very brief. I'm here in support of this agenda item and your adoption of this uh, resolution. Um, I 
pretty much echo all the comments that Adam made already, so I won't repeat those. Um, just to put this in context, though, I, I feel that um, uh, maybe just to give you a few numbers that will give you some examples of why we feel like this is important. Um, for um, on the, your next agenda item, on the fee item, we looked and tried to estimate what our total fees would be um, under the new fee schedule. And we estimate that they will go up for all of our facilities, um, a, a total, and so this is across all the facilities, of over $220,000. So that's per year ongoing into the future. That brings our total fee um, uh, payments to the water boards to almost $2 million for our wastewater and solid waste facilities. So we're a pretty big fee payer. We care about these. We do watch our pennies, not just our dollars. And um, give you another example of um, where some of the efficiencies might be available um, through um, working with our regional board, they initiated about eight or ten years ago watershed monitoring programs in our region and they've been implementing those. Well, those are funded by the NPDES wastewater dischargers and it started in our San Gabriel River watershed. And so for five of our water reclamation plants, we um, were able to look a along with other stakeholders and the regional board staff at the uh, monitoring programs, identify ways that we could um, re achieve efficiencies, reduce uh, frequencies of monitoring th and things like that, and achieve over $400,000 of savings for those five plants per year. And that money now is used to fund the watershed monitoring program. But that gives you an example of just for five plants an annual savings of over 400,000. Now we estimated, we just re-upped that program and we're, um, we re-estimated the savings, which we now estimate to be 430,000 per year. So there's quite a bit, of, you know, it, it raises questions like, why are we doing all of this monitoring that now we can call unnecessary or, you know, that we can do things more efficiently? And so I, th I think some of those opportunities are still out there maybe with other dischargers to um, look and maybe modernize their, their monitoring and reporting programs. To answer that question, yes. I, I, I liken this into uh, walking into your closet and saying, why did I buy that, you know, t 10 <laughs> years ago? So I think it was a good metaphor. reason to do it then, but, but we should look at these things again. Yeah, I mean, obviously you don't have to do it every year, but you do it every so many years and you're, you're going to see that, you know, maybe some things are obsolete, but they do tend to get carried over permit cycle after permit cycle. So. Um, anyway, we do really appreciate uh, the board's engagement, the staff's engagement, and all the hard work of the stakeholders. I personally have not been very involved, so I really appreciate everybody else's hard work on this. Thank you very right. much. Thank you very much. Although I'm a little unhappy with my <laughs> colleague over here because now I'm thinking about cleaning my closet, which I hate. <laughs> it's kind of a bummer, really. You've got to buy me a cappuccino at the next I break, will. all right? Thank you. It'll make me happier. Maybe bacon, too. Both. All right, sorry. <laughs> Sarah, I'm inside. Good afternoon, Chair Marcus and board members. My name is Sarah Amanzada, and I'm the Executive Director of California Coastkeeper Alliance. We represent 12 local waterkeeper groups, including Santa Barbara Channel Keeper and Monterey Coastkeeper, who are here today. Although I understand the impetus for this work and I know why you feel it's necessary, I must restate my objection to the board's overall focus on the cost of compliance to dischargers and oppose this resolution. It is my personal and direct experience that in the va vast majority of water board policies and processes, economic considerations and cost of compliance are raised repeatedly by re the regulated community in these processes. And I fundamentally don't understand why we are carving out a platform and space to consider these things even more so. Um, it's been my experience that the discussions around various permits and policies already revolve um, to a large extent around cost issues. And so for me, there's just a fundamental disconnect about creating um, even more of a platform to address these issues. And I also have some serious issues with some of the resolution provisions in particular. Um, and although we are open to participating in work to identify regulatory efficiencies, I also have concerns about the process undertaken to develop these um, recommendations and work plans. 
With respect to the process, um, and I do want to recognize board members' efforts to bring NGOs into the process and from the stakeholders themselves, but in general, NGOs have generally been brought in at the last minute and have not provided meaningful input on these recommendations, which creates a fundamental disconnect between the stated purpose of the resolution, which is to reduce cost of compliance while maintaining water quality protection. I don't necessarily see that there are people involved in these work groups that are concerned with the latter piece, which is critical, of maintaining water quality protection. Other than the state and regional board staff and the dischargers. Right. Because right. right. you're not implying that they don't care about water quality. Not at all. Right. But, but essentially, you're creating a side process to the policy and permit development that we undertake all together, which primarily includes the regulated community and regulators, and which NGOs and environmental groups are largely left out of. That's, that's the point that I'm trying to illustrate. And Sarah, I, again, must object. And I said that the last time when you spoke on this item, this entire process was an open process. Uh, staff invited everyone to participate. I've seen the matrices of the hundreds of people who participated in these four individual um, stakeholder groups. And there were NGO representatives. There were names involved. You did not stick with the effort. You did not provide input from there early on. Um, you know, I, I think, again, it goes back to my question to the gentleman who, who um, spoke on our performance report about, um, about including performance or public participation metrics. <laughs> I mean, you can invite people to participate, but if they don't, you can't make them, and then they come afterwards, and how do you measure your effectiveness in engaging people? You can only make the opportunity available. Well, in fact, I have been involved to some extent. I was asked to and did provide, along with other NGOs, um, specific recommendation responses for the POTW stakeholder We're group. Involved. And I have attended you know, other meetings and calls. Um, and I hope you'll agree that I'm generally very involved in board processes and policies. But with respect to this effort, it seems that the overall process is inherently skewed towards the cost of compliance and is not assessing the cost of non-compliance, the cost that, to the environment and health that we might incur from implementing these recommendations. A lot of the monitoring requirements are characterized as unnecessary or redundant. Well, it is our, my perspective and the perspective of many NGOs that, in fact, these monitoring requirements, as well as the other requirements in our permits and policies, were carefully crafted to protect water quality and water resources. So the overall mission or purpose of these work groups, from my perspective, sort of discourages NGO input because there doesn't seem to be an entry point into the discussion. Um, before I adjourn, I know we have a packed agenda today, I did just want to raise some specific concerns yeah. with provision six, which provides that the water board shall work with stakeholders to include cost of considerations and an economic checklist as we develop the biological objectives policy. Again, I just feel that this would inappropriately and um, inappropriately insert cost of consideration into the policy making process to the extent that it would become imbalanced. In other words, we're always considering the cost of compliance and the economic impacts of policies, but this would um, sort of prematurely insert those considerations as we look at that policy.